Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech here on a given Thursday, American Issues, American Issues, take two. Uh, is Trump's star ascending or waning? Uh, we should be able to tell this year with my co-host, Tim Apicella, our special guest, Colleen Anabusa, applause, okay, and Stephanie Stoltz-Alton. Thank you all for showing up this morning. Let's talk about the subject. Let me start with you, Tim. Uh, the, the, uh, the question of the day, is his star ascending or waning? And please give your analysis. My answer, good morning, Jay. My answer is yet to be determined. Uh, the primaries were a 50-50 split almost. Uh, you had uh, him lose um, someone that uh, was just a train wreck of a candidate, Madison uh, Cawthorn uh, from uh, North Carolina. And, and Donald Trump begged and pleaded to give this guy a second chance. Well, he was a train wreck. Uh, if you saw any of the videos that were posted, and oh, it was a mess. Uh, so he lost, but he didn't lose by much. He only lost by maybe uh, 1,300 votes. It should have been that close. So in some ways, uh, Donald Trump's influence uh, was present in that, in that uh, loss for, for Cuff Horn. Uh, but the big one of the day was, of course, Donald Trump's animosity towards uh, uh, Brian Kemp, governor of uh, Georgia. And uh, David Perdue, his, his anointed candidate, lost badly. And the bottom line is that's a, a major blow to Donald Trump and his, uh, if you will, kingmaker uh, abilities and uh, that's, that was a cannonball across his bow. And uh, Brad Raffensperger, you know, Secretary of State, he also won in, in, in that primary. So here's two major candidates that Donald Trump loathed, and yet they, uh, they made it through. So that's, I think that's kind of an indication. It's not a crack in the, uh, the globe, so to speak. But the real test, I think, is going to come here in June. You're going to see Donald Trump say all sorts of things in the media about the select committee's hearings. And we'll see if that sticks or not. I think it's a real test about his influence or the waning of his influence. Wow, fabulous answer. Colleen, how much of what Tim said do you agree with? Well, I agree with the fact that uh, we don't really know yet. But one of the things that I would add to what Tim said is, uh, you know, should how many of us thought we'd be having even this topic at this point. How many of us thought that, uh, you know, Donald Trump would be a footnote by now, but instead he's still a factor and in some places a major factor when you're talking about the, this election cycle. And I think that that's really, like, like you said, is it ascending or waning? It's, it's probably, we can't tell whether it's one of those two adjectives, but it should be more a matter of, Aren't we all surprised, especially those of us in Hawaii and wondering why are we even discussing this? Because he's there and he's he's got an he's got an impact, whether it's going to be a great impact or not as great as we thought. The point is, he has an impact enough for us to have this discussion. Yeah. You know, when uh, Tim and I were discussing the show yesterday, was it a day, day or two ago, we were wondering whether we should use. Trump's name at all. We, 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 <laughs> some kind of coded name, because we don't want to give him any publicity whatsoever. So, Stephanie, that takes me to you. You know, it's possible uh, that uh, Elon Musk is going, I mean, I don't think it's as big a chance as it was, but uh, Elon Musk is going to buy Twitter. And he has said if he buys Twitter, Trump is back on. Okay. How does that change the calculus? For us, thank you for the question. And and Jay, your point about a remedy for getting him out of our lives, I, I think we're way past that point. This man is established, you know, as a star, literally from his TV stint, like it or not. Um, and uh, and now he's uh, gone on uh, through the, the 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 role of president. Um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, he uh, did make that that stop to be a star uh, in that category. But what what we have here is someone that now has promoted people who had no power previously to be as effective as they are now in 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 making a difference for our country's policy and our our, our country's lawmaking. So what's happened is those people have had um, the opportunity to rise 
and be most influential, i.e. the gun control, the abortion, all of the all of these issues, you know, have now been moved into the center stage and are getting uh, promoted by people who before had very less less voice. So that's what's happened because Trump had to draw on those people and strengthen their power, status and voice in order for himself to stay elected and in power. So what he's done is unleashed you know, opened the Pandora's box, right, for these people. And the question is whether um, this democracy is going to thrive with a, a more empowered, what appears to maybe be a minority for the majority and to, to see if we're going to go into a situation where the majority, um, the, as we know, and as our tradition has held, uh, will still have as much voice as they've always had. Things are not looking really good now. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether Trump stays, goes, leaves the planet, what have you. He's already and he's already infected everything. Oh, I'm I'm feeling better every minute, Stephanie. <laughs> That's Thank right. you for, for Here those we go. remarks. So New Tim, way. you know, you said before it's hard to tell, you know, and we'll as we get closer to the election and as we see him, you know, react to the uh, select committee, uh, we'll we'll get a better handle. Um, but let me, let me, uh, so there's two choices. One is his star is rising and the other is it's waning. Let's assume just for a moment that his star is rising. Let's assume that he gets back on Twitter. Let's assume that, you know, he makes a big stink about the select committee. It's all a witch hunt and people believe him. Uh, let's assume that his people, you know, or people who are ac acolytes in some way uh, win, um, at least some of them in November. Uh, how does that change um, the picture for 2024? And and let's assume also that Trump wins as president. Oh, oh, Mr. T, Mr. T, in president in 2024. How does that change the country? You have two hours to frame your answer. You're, you're muted. Sorry, I'll, I'll need three hours on that, Jay. Um, <laughs> the bottom line is how to affect our country. Come on, we've talked about this when, uh, during Trump week for four years. Uh, it will be the beginning of the end of our democracy as we know it. It will be the beginning of end for uh, fair and free elections as we know it. It will be the beginning of end of the rule of law. Um, the list goes on. And uh, forever, our democracy will be slowly converting to a, an autocracy. And I don't think it'll take long this time. I think he knows he knows the ropes now. He knows that uh, what the mistakes he made in his first term, and he won't waste time in the second term. So to answer your question, um, not good. But you know, MAGA is more than Donald Trump now. MAGA is the GOP party's uh, mantra. And the bottom line is, uh, they don't need Donald Trump to continue MAGA. Uh, you know, about two weeks ago, we uh, we had a show with uh, Governor John Wahey. And he said something very profound, and it was Donald Trump has given permission for people to act badly, to say, say you know, very inappropriate comments when they're at the microphone, and worse yet, develop policies that are very destructive for the American people. And that permission is the greatest legacy that Donald Trump has left, whether or not his star rises or not. And it's that permission we need to put back into Pandora's box. Yeah, true. Well, Colleen, we, I saved a very hard one for you. I'm sorry. You'll, in time, you'll learn to forgive me for this question. Suppose we find that Trump's power is waning. What happens? What happens in November? What happens in 2024? This is really a black box question. <laughs> it's almost impossible to, to answer this, but I know you can. Colleen is 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 quite capable. She's a practicing lawyer. Uh, she's on the hard board, um, and she uh, she's with the Cincinnati Bell, which uh, runs uh, Hawaiian Telecom. So, with all of that experience, what's your answer? <laughs> if it's waning, we're assuming it's going to wane. Yes. Well, I I would like to say first of all, we should all hope that it's waning, yes. and it's not even being at status quo. Uh, and definitely not ascending. However, I'm not sure that we can make that assumption because what we're missing in this whole thing, this black box that you talk about, Jay, is, is the people. And who are the people? And I know for many of us in Hawaii, especially, we have to get past the point that 
nobody in their right mind could possibly be for Donald Trump. That's how many of us feel. But look at how many votes he even got here. On his second effort, he, he did extremely well considering what you would have thought. So what does it tell us? It tells us that Donald Trump isn't the focus as much as it's the people who he's appealing to. That's who we should be trying to analyze. What is it that Donald Trump is saying that the people out there who support him, even if it's 30 something percent of the vote, mm -hmm. or even if whatever it may be, what is it that he's saying that people want to hear? I think it's not so much what people want to hear, but people are afraid that they are hearing, which is this word called fear. And what Donald Trump gives them is this sense that somehow they're now empowered again. They're empowered by this person who was the president of the United States, and he's going to give them that ability. You know, I think um, in a way we're so used to the concept of people of color, but it's like, when you think about the population by the year 2045 being 51% or more than majority of the people will be people of color. Well, and you know, I think it frightens a lot of people. So what, and I'm not talking about Hawaii, I'm talking about the rest of this country. So what is it that he represents? He represents to some this ability to cling to that which they thought was made America the greatest country. That's what his mantra is. You know, I, I taught a course in 2016, the Poli-Sci Department of the University of Hawaii. And, and I said, what he's saying that people like to hear is America is the best country in the world. And if you don't like it, leave. And, and there's, there's a lot of people who think, wow, now that's simple, concise, and to the point and expresses how I feel, not me, but you know how they feel. And this is what really is the essence of Trump. He has an ability, which I don't think many of us give him credit for, to go to, as you would say in Hawaii, the na'au, the gut, and say, okay, what is it that people want? What do you want? People want, no matter how we deny it, how we all want equality, how we all believe that there shouldn't be discrimination and so forth. Everybody can be generous if you are sound and safe in yourself. The problem is people don't feel that way anymore. People don't feel safe. They want to be in the position of dominance or power. That's what this black box is. It's the people. Donald Trump wouldn't exist but for the people who actually permit him to exist. So we got to understand what is it that's fueling them? What is it that's making them feel like they need a Donald Trump to empower them, to, for them to rally behind, for them to wear those hats, you know, about America and what it is. And, you know, the, what is it? And, and I think that's what we all have to understand. Donald Trump is just the symbol. It's a symbol of a very sad time, in my opinion, and it's a symbol of how things may change, especially if he picks up steam in this upcoming election. And by that, I mean, the fact that he stays relevant this long is frightening enough. Mm. Mm. I, I get it. The black box is really a black box of national me mental illness. That's what the black box is. <laughs> So, Stephanie, um, we, we still have, let me count the months. We have um, June, July, August, September, October, you know, maybe. Um, there are a lot of things that are going to happen before this dispositive, arguably dispositive election in November. And, and th these things are not, um, you know, they're not, they're not static. They're dynamic. And for that, Trump's possibilities are dynamic, too. Anything could happen. Anything could happen, good or bad, could happen. God knows how many shootings we're going to have, right? Uh, just for one example. So what do you think the elements of that dynamic are? What could happen to make him do better or worse between now and November? Well, I think that um, I must uh, compliment uh, Colleen Hanabusa's point and, uh, and say 
how well she spoke to it. And I believe it's something we haven't come to accept um, about America and Americans. And um, I believe that it means that there actually is um, a huge group that has been disenfranchised, that, that has always been disenfranchised. And they haven't had their hands or their seats at the table or anything like that. They haven't had access for new, a new number of reasons. And the number of reasons may have to do with certainly um, the, the attention to uh, black and brown and all kinds of people who are recognized and now publicly uh, acclaimed as um, disenfranchised trying to get into the game and the conversation and the power game. Um, but this other group is um, maybe um, the best way to describe it is to say, if, if, if you only focus on um, minority and um, the diversity of, of America being disserved, like in education. So those people being so disserved by the systems um, and, the, and the under uh, and the high need, the high need kids. And the point is that if you go and actually look at the high need data, the, the actual numbers of these people, there are more white people that are high need and disenfranchised and deprived and disadvantaged than there are others. They are the largest group and that we have not really done much about that to address it and, and publicize it and make people understand how big is the challenge to bring all American people into the game and in, in, into getting educated to the level that they need for democracy and getting a chance to be at the table and be powerful. So I think in the meantime, as we struggle through this, um, it, it's hard. hard. And it may look like some horses are ahead of other horses that shouldn't be, and we're going in. But ultimately, what are we going to do? We we want to do. We want everybody uh, in franchise. We want everybody in the power. Well, that's that's easy. That's uh, easier to say than, than make it happen. Uh, Tim, uh, what does the name Jamie Harrison mean for you? The head of the DNC. Now, what is the DNC doing on this issue? I mean, we have a, a I don't want to say volatile, but a dynamic experience going on. Uh, and we know, for example, your comment before the show began about the Proud Boys in Florida. Um, you know, the GOP is moving every day, every day. And these legislators, you know, Cynthia Sinclair can talk about that. Um, and this, all this stuff is happening. And they're not necessarily seeking press about it. They're just no, they're moving. playing the long game under the, under the cover and the, under the wraps. They're playing the long game and they've been doing it for decades. And now, the, you know, the fruit of their uh, patience is paying off. You know, you look at um, the traumatic, uh, dramatic, not traumatic, the dramatic shift from Hispanic votes from the Democratic Party to the Republicans, especially in Florida. And what is that attributed to? The GOP's long game of convincing voters that the Democratic Party is nothing but a bunch of socialists. Well, guess what? Most of those voters in Florida come from socialistic countries, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, you name it, half of South America was socialist, and they don't want that anymore. Yet the successful targeted marketing has convinced them that the Democratic Party is nothing but socialist. So that's why you're seeing a, a huge shift in um, demographics votes uh, to now go towards GOP. They're voting against their interests, but they're doing it. Uh, you look at uh, the white fear factor, the white replacement. Again, a masterful stroke on the GOP's part to convince grievance uh, white you know, low income earning uh, um, Americans that Donald Trump is their savior and not not the Democratic Party, that because Democratic Party is a bunch of wokes and they're going to replace your white power. And again, a subtle message that has been coming, not so subtle, but very, very powerful. You're seeing not policies being uh, voted on, but grievances and social wedge issues. OK, Colleen, I think I'm, I'm ready to soak my head now. Uh, <laughs> now, now, Hawaii, everybody says Hawaii is a microcosm, right? And indeed, you know, uh, I mean, Ed Case himself will tell you that that one third of the electorate of Hawaii are Trumpers. Incredible. I would never have expected that because he's racist. He's a white supremacist. And yet one third of the people in Hawaii believe in him. I, I, I don't know what the disconnect is, but there you have it. What can we learn? You referred to it earlier. What can we learn from the Hawaii experience, the Hawaii, you know, the dominance of the Democratic Party uh, and historically, you know, the acceptance of a diversity of 
races and cultures uh, from way back when. What, what, what can we learn from Hawaii that could be useful uh, to have Jamie Harrison fashion an appropriate strategy on the, on the national scale? You know, uh, whenever I have a question like that, I, it, it goes back, I was, uh, I don't even remember the incident, but remember when uh, John F. Kennedy came to Hawaii and I think he spoke to a, uh, a conference of mayors, that was in 1960 something. And, I'm, I'm and, sorry, Julian, uh, I can't remember any of that. I'm, I'm happy that you could... None of us can remember that, right? <laughs> but what, what he's quoted as saying is Hawaii, something like Hawaii is what the rest of this nation should become. And it, and it was, I think, the statement about the diversity and the uniqueness of Hawaii. So what is it that as we look at the statistics, what is it that's changing? What And, you know, it could be very similar to what Tim was talking about with how the Hispanic votes have changed in Florida. I think it's more than this, the fact that they play to the Hispanic vote. I think it is as we have in America, as the next generations come up, second and third generations, they tend to be uh, successful business people. They tend to be more educated. You know, I mean, you know, for the longest time, how many people said, uh, like uh, my grandmothers used to say, well, you're a girl child, so you should become a DOE teacher. They didn't know DOE, but you should be a, you should be a teacher <laughs> because that's what girl childs do and you'll get benefits and you'll do all. I mean, that's these right. are the things that are ingrained to us when, when we are young. So what, what, how does that all translate to what's going on now? When the generations change and the generations, quote, make it, so to speak, then it becomes a totally new set of values, right? So the haves, the have-nots become the haves. And then we have that whole, and then you have this whole kind of cyclical effect. So what Hawaii could lead the rest of the nation in is if we can figure out how you can do this transition, but still maintain that great social fiber. And I don't mean it as socialism, but I mean that that sense of equality, the sense of how it should be fundamentally fair and just. If we could figure out how with ascension into the next level, so to speak, of success, you can still remain like that, still not forget the roots. That's where we could lead. But I'm afraid that we may be following like the rest of the nation, that we are doing exactly what everyone else is doing that we're going to lose one or two generations in there about people who have made it. And then what do they do? Do you make it and say, well, I made it, so you go ahead and do it? That's what's unfortunately, I think, coming about. Why is it, for example, we couldn't do a, a more affirmative immigration law? Is it because we don't believe in immigration? Or is it because those who may have come over now feel, hey, we did it. You go and do it. It's the bootstrap. You know, you got to take yourself and bring yourself up. Is that the American dream? You work mm -hmm. hard and then you should be able to succeed. So why you don't need handouts? I mean, you know, that's that's what this whole discussion is going to come down to. Who we are and what are the fundamental values that we bring to this discussion? Mm. You know, I think about that all the time. Because I believe that the young people that I meet and talk to, the, the people I see on the tube and read about and hear about, they are different. They're not the Trumpers. The, the, it's the, the young people, and some of them are stupid, I'm sorry they're Trumpers, but, but most of them that I see offer the prospect of a, a, a next generation, Stephanie, uh, that, that will be better. And part of that is you know, how we educate them, part of that is how they coalesce, part of that is Jamie Harrison, um, if they could come together, we would have a better time. But my question to you, all that considered, Stephanie, is do we have the time to let them ripen, to let them take charge, to let them express themselves, to let them take power? Um, the Proud Boys are operating right now today. The next generation of these kids would be great, but do we have the time? 
Good question, because we don't have the time. And that, the question I'd like to add is, do we have the ergs to do it? And otherwise, the grit, the ergs, the willingness to stand up and, um, and get this on the agenda, the national agenda. And I think that Hawaii has not done that numerous times. And Hawaii has led the nation on numerous um, uh, advances that, that the country has sought and has been a star for 10 minutes. And then the next thing, uh, someone else takes it over. I mean, the best example is, of course, Medicare, I mean, medical, the, the, um, the medical plan of uh, Hawaii and how Hawaii has considered the medical needs of its citizens forever. And yeah, think, think of Roe v. Wade before Roe v. Wade. Hawaii was way out there. Exactly. Okay. But it gets swiped off the it gets swiped out of the conversation. As soon as Hawaii was top notch and getting all this good publicity, then here comes Massachusetts. Oh, well, we've got this. Thing. And then they they're always referred to as the as the model and the leader. And I've seen this in a couple of other categories too. I'm not prepared to speak to all of those, but I've I've always been amazed that we're not acknowledged as the model we as in is the state of Hawaii is not acknowledged as that leadership model and uh and for serious uh, legislative initiatives and all of these these ways the pro the ways that we believe and live out here it has not gotten enough it's gotten credit but I don't think it's gotten enough credit and doesn't get enough attention at all I mean especially being majority minority forever and who gets the big hoorah California once they go over the one percent mark so Anyway, I agree. I we we have. I think that we could grab onto it if leadership or those opportunities. Well, I think Tech Hawaii can promote the state of Hawaii for the outstanding uh, citizen of the of the country and the nation that, that I think it is and doesn't get credit for. Colleen, we're we're uh, just about out of time, and I I want to offer everybody the opportunity to make um, you know closing statements, whatever is on your mind uh, as a result of this discussion or not. Um, and I would ask you first, uh, you know, our topic has been, uh, is Trump's star ascending or waning? We should be able to tell this this year, but maybe not. Uh, what are your thoughts? What would you like to leave with our viewing audience about this topic? I think what I'd like to leave everyone with is, is this. We always talk about the next generation. We always talk about where we're going to be, what's going to happen to this country. What we have to spend more time with is asking the next generation, what is it that he, Trump has, that would lead you to want to follow? Or what is it about him that you don't want to follow? What is it about anybody that you feel is there that's exemplary and something that you believe in? I think our problem is we all talk about the next generation, but we don't spend any time listening to them or talking to them. <laughs> that's what we've got to do. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Stephanie, you next. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, I, we have to acknowledge that there is value in Trump and Trumpism and MAGA. And what is it? And we need to know better, those of us who are on uh, not not enthused by it. We need to understand it better so that um, we can be in better positions to influence others if, if one you know, to to move on to other things. But anyway, so that that's one of the, the points I wanted to make, because he's not this is not going away. It's not people are not coming to their senses. In fact, there's so much more going on than that. So let's get a handle on this, find out what it is. And as uh, you all have discussed, you know, get active about it. this party and um, the nation needs to get active about it and acknowledge it for what it is. It's here. And we've got to deal with it. Tim, your thoughts, but let me let me offer this uh, to cover, if you would, is we're, we're not we're not only, um, you know, in the four corners of the United States. We are the city on the hill, or at least we used to be. And we have a, a big effect on the world and, the, and world history going forward, especially in Europe and Ukraine, but also in Asia. Um, so how does this all play out? Uh, the world is watching, Tim. What are your thoughts? Well, first off, I apologize. There's a lot of construction noise that just started up, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, the world is watching, and I think what the world has watched is that Donald Trump, we, we've mentioned this in previous shows, has really become quite a powerful cult figure. And by a cult figure, I mean it's um, he's taken the grievances and he's hypnotized people in such a way that 
regardless of his boorish behavior or, or horrible words, uh, they like him. They follow him without question. Total loyalty. And I think the world is watching to see if we fall back into that trap again. And, you know, it's important to take a powerful, dangerous cult figure and render that individual into an insignificant fad. That's it. Okay, well, I feel a little better. I, I probably will not stoke my head today. Uh, but thank you very much, my co-host, Tim Apicella, our special guest, Colleen Hanabusa, and our regular contributor, Stephanie Stoltz-Alton, for a great and important discussion. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.